A warm welcome to this edition of the Center for Social Development Studies Political Ecology and Asia Dialogue series. My name is Carl Middleton and I'm the director of the CSDS and today we are very happy to invite Dr. Helena Varki to join us. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, please allow me to introduce you a little bit uh, before we begin. Uh, Helena is currently a senior lecturer at the Department of International and Strategic Studies in the University of Malaya. She is also a visiting senior research fellow at the Asia Research Institute of the National University of Singapore, where she's working on a project on sustainable governance of transboundary environmental commons in Southeast Asia. Helena earned her doctor a doctorate from the Department of Government and International Relations at the University of Sydney, Australia. And her research currently focuses on to transboundary pollution in Southeast Asia, including on the role of patronage in agribusiness, especially the oil palm industry and its linkages with forest fires and haze in the region. And this is the topic that we'll be discussing today. Uh, Helena has published regularly in international academic journals and has also just recently published a book that's titled The Haze Problem in Southeast Asia, Palm Oil and Patronage, which is available on Routledge if you would like to read it. Uh, Helena is also very active as a speaker at international conferences and in regional forums and is also regularly invited as a commentator for broadcast media and writes in uh, regional and international newspapers on the topics of her uh, expertise. So before we begin uh, the discussion with Helena, uh, please allow me to briefly introduce about the dialogue series. Uh, so this is a recent initiative of the Center for Social Development Studies and we hold the objective of encouraging rigorous debate through the lens of political ecology on development issues and trends in Southeast Asia, including the social, economic and environmental changes that are taking place. We intend to emphasize both the deeply embedded challenges and trying to understand them, but also looking for ways forward that could be transformative. We hope that through this dialogue series, we can find new angles on development and political ecology in Southeast Asia, and that it will also encourage debate amongst researchers, civil society, and public intellectuals and others within the region and beyond. Uh, so with that introduction, um, let's uh, begin our discussion with Helena. Uh, to begin with, please, could I ask you to outline what exactly is Hayes in Southeast Asia? And where does it com come from? How is it created? And who's affected by it and how? Okay, uh, thank you so much, Carl. So I'll start with that um, sort of overarching question. Uh, haze in Southeast Asia, we must understand that it's actually a regional problem, uh, but there's actually two sort of uh, sub problems. So there is the haze in Southern Southeast Asia and there's the haze in the Northern part of the Mekong region. And um, both of them, they look the same in the sense that they are, you know, forests, I mean, they are coming from smoke from fires, but the root reasons are a bit different. So um, they're both agriculturally linked mostly, but in the Southern Southeast Asia, it's more related to a very unique kind of soil, which is peat soil, which I'll talk about in a while. And uh, my research mainly focuses on the haze in the southern part of Southeast Asia. Um, and actually the, the haze problem um, in the northern part has become much more intense in the past year. So this is, some, this is sort of a new angle and a lot of re researchers are also increasingly looking into that. But my research has sort of always been on the south. So I'll, I will focus more on that, uh, if you don't mind. Um, and of course, in the south, uh, it centers around peatland use, as I mentioned. And it's all about um, how the peatland is used. So I'll just mention a bit about what is so unique about peatlands. Um, Indonesia and Malaysia, we have a lot of peatlands. And it's a very uh, special type of land because it is very carbon rich. Uh, and this means that it's very important for the carbon balance. And actually peatlands, um, they are basically forests which are partially submerged. So if you go to a peatland, you will see there's sort of like, um, uh, it's sort of like a lake almost with a forest on top of it. And um, in its natural circumstances, it's flooded with this sort of very black water. Um, and this makes it very important for the carbon balance because what happens is 
all of the, the leaves and, and the branches that fall down into this water, instead of, uh, instead of being, um, you know, converted uh, from, you know, uh, from, a, from a, what do we call it, uh, into carbon and escaping into the atmosphere, because when you contact with uh, oxygen, it goes underground and it's sort of preserved that way. And um, as it preserves and it sinks down and the layers build up, uh, the, the soil that is below the water table, it's very carbon rich. And that's why we call peatlands a carbon sink. So um, that makes it so important for conservation. Um, however, the issue is when these peatlands get drained and um, for agriculture, because there's a lot of push or, or demand for land for agriculture. When they are drained physically, you have to dig canals in the peatlands to drain away all the water. Um, these places get extremely dry and they can either catch fire accidentally or there could also be intentional uses of fire, which I'll talk about later. And basically when a fire occurs here, it usually very rarely occurs if it's wet, but when it's dry, um, you can imagine that it will become very uh, fire prone very quickly because they're all carbon material. They are very, um, they're very uh, flammable. So they become fire prone and when the fire does occur, um, it's very carbon rich, very sooty and um, basically peatland fires go on for ages because there's so much fuel on the ground. So you can imagine that it's a total, um, the ground is on fire. So actually one of the unique things about peat fires is that you won't actually be able to see the flames. The flames are all underground and it makes it very hard to put out because essentially you will have to flood the whole area. And because it's so hard to put out and because the nature of these fires are so, um, the smoke is so carbon rich, uh, the smoke can really travel really far, far, far away. And, um, uh, you know, the southern fires that happen in Indonesia, sometimes in Malaysia, it can affect almost all of Southeast Asia. Even the Mekong region sometimes can be affected by the fires uh, in, 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 in Indonesia and sometimes in Malaysia as well. And how that affects, the second part of your question is how that affects um, things in, in, in the region, right? Uh, so, Usually, the most common countries that are involved or are affected are Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, the sort of southern countries. Um, and economy-wise, uh, there's going to be disruptions. People can't go to work. Uh, there will be disruptions in terms of tourism. Uh, airports need to close. Of course, now in the context of COVID, we have a different view of that. Uh, but definitely, there's so much economic disruption. Indonesia itself, uh, there's been some figures that the 2019 haze was about half of its, I mean, half a percent of its GDP. And 2015 was even more, 2% of its GDP was uh, reduced because of haze related uh, limitations on the economy. Uh, in terms of health, uh, haze is proven to be very dangerous. Uh, the type of, as I've mentioned just now, the sort of carbon rich, uh, biomass burning uh, smoke is very dangerous for the human body and uh, it's really small in diameter so that we can actually breathe it in. Um, it's not filtered out. Uh, we breathe it in, it goes into our bloodstream. There's all kinds of problems, breathing problems, dermatological problems, uh, eye problems as well. And there has been research recently that showed that about 40,000 to 100,000 additional deaths were caused by the 2015 fires. So that means that 40 to 100,000 additional people died because of the fires. And we have also social effects, like people can't go to school, can't go to work, can't go and exercise. We have emergencies. Um, and of course, the most important, or rather the most, um, the most impactful is the political uh, aspect to it. Uh, because of haze, there has been heightened tensions between Malaysia and Indonesia, Malaysia, um, Singapore and Indonesia. Um, and um, this has also triggered, of course, ASEAN to get involved, which could be, a, which is a good thing, which we will discuss later. Uh, but definitely there's an economics, politics, social health angle. So these are all the various ways that haze is affecting us in the region. And um, I wonder if you could explain a little bit more, why are the peatlands being drained in the first place? And why do the fires happen? Right. Uh, so the, the answer to that is basically very much linked to the demand for land. Uh, so of course, Malaysia, Indonesia especially, we are a very land rich country. We have a lot of land, um, a lot of forests as well. Uh, but 
you know, a lot of these forests are, we have, uh, let's say, um, indigenous people staying in the forest. And we have some forests which are, let's say, encumbered by, um, uh, let's say, some certain protection uh, rule, rules. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the mineral soil forests, which are sort of the traditional uh, rainforests, uh, they may be protected, or they may be they may have other sort of uh, access rights to them. Uh, so sometimes it may be difficult to get land in this way. And um, some of the land types that kind of fall through the cracks include um, peatlands. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, peatlands are usually, as I mentioned, no, people don't stay on the peatlands because they are wet. They usually stay on the, on the sort of periphery. So there's less of a risk of getting into sort of uh, like if you're a big company, uh, you want to go, you have to pay compensation to the people who are living there, you know. So um, it's easier when you don't have to worry about that. Peatlands are usually also, nobody's really working on it, so it's unencumbered usually. And it's usually quite far away from city centres, so it's pretty like a kind of a nice quiet place that, you know, you can, you can sort of uh, do things with. And we'll talk about how patronage comes into that. I think you have a question on me for that. But basically the idea is that peatlands are usually more unencumbered compared to other lands that are already out there. And of course, the other lands may also already have certain other uh, agriculture on them in, in, in either uh, intense or non-intensive uh, manner. Uh, why they are drained is because um, if you want to use it for sort of large-scale agriculture, if you want to use it for peatlands, uh, for palm oil, if you want to use it for pulp and paper, um, you will have to drain it because it's just too wet to use otherwise. Uh, so the sort of interesting thing about uh, peatlands is usually it is considered to be infertile. Uh, so it's not usually a traditional sort of rich soil that is usually used for a lot of other things like rubber or anything like that. Um, it's a, but but certain, certain trees do grow well on peatlands and one of them is palm oil. Uh, palm oil is very, um, it, it can withstand a lot of water. Uh, so that's why it, it, is, it can live on, it, it can sort of prosper on peatlands. And, um, and for other various um, sort of soil, soil science reasons, palm oil is quite suitable for peatlands. Um, and because of that, it has, uh, palm oil has been one of the industries that are very viable as long as you do drain it. Um, and um, in terms of uh, pulp and paper as well, a lot, uh, some of the original trees that were uh, already on peatlands, um, they have, they are sort of trees that can be used for pulp anyway, so they're quite suitable for that kind of trees. Um, and in terms of why do they catch fire, uh, usually the, 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 the issue is when you drain peatlands, first of all, you would have to cut down all the trees that are there. So usually what happens is when a company comes in, they cut down all the trees and these trees are usually quite precious in the sense that they are like ramen, they can be used for furniture and all that kind of stuff. So they cut them all down and they can sell them uh, to get usually the startup capital for them to establish their plantation. Um, so they cut them down and then they will sell whatever they can sell. But then there is still a lot of, you know, uh, small, smaller trees, there are a lot of like bracken and all this. And usually the traditional way to clear a land in preparation for planting is to burn all this away. And this would not really be a big problem if it was done on mineral soil, like I mentioned earlier, because in mineral soil, the, the soil itself is not very flammable. So it would just be sort of like a surface fire. But the problem is for peatlands, uh, more often than not, if the fire is there, it will go underground and it will spread and you will have this sort of prolonged problem of haze. So that is the problem of, I mean, that's how usually, um, especially in the late 1990s, early 2000s, this was what's happening. Um, but I must say that um, recently when we have more of a, a outcry and concern about this, people are talking about this more, we do see that big companies are being a bit more careful with, um, you know, they're not actually op uh, so openly doing this open burning anymore. So that's definitely an improvement and that has come from people talking about it. Uh, people like us talking about it and, and, and activists and all that. So that's great. But the situation remains that uh, any peatlands, when they are drained, they are more fire prone anyway. 
And the nature of peatlands is that they are sort of a basin. So if you imagine a big bowl of water um, and you drain one part of the bowl, the, the whole bowl, the water level will go down. So let's say if a, if a company drains one part of a big basin, a big peat basin, there will be other areas of the peatland that are also drying out because of the drainage that occurs in the company's area. And that's when you have fires that are happening sort of outside the border of plantations, just outside or a bit further in, um, that is not directly caused by the plantations, but, but is caused by the action of draining. So um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot more instances of this sort of seemingly unrelated fires, but actually they are still linked to the process of land clearing. So that is when we see that, you know, um, even though there's, no, there's not there's reduced number of intentional fires, the fact that peatlands are still being, you know, the land use of peatlands is still going on, uh, the land use change is still going on, you will find situations where fires occur where you wouldn't normally have fires. And this is what still drives the problem of haze in the region. Great, thank you so much. So I, I understand that more clearly now. Um, so you mentioned that a lot of the um, conversion of peatland is into plantations. And I mean, this is big business for uh, countries like Indonesia. Um, and these agribusiness companies are often very large and influential. So. I know that a part of your research has been examining the, the role of patronage in agribusiness. So mm -hmm. I wonder if you could share a little bit about your analysis on why patronage is an important issue to understanding the issue of haze in, uh, in the southern part of Southeast Asia. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so for, with patronage, um, it's sort of a way of doing business in Southeast Asia, and I believe it's quite similar in the northern part as well. But especially in Indonesia and in Malaysia, um, this is something that's quite normal. And um, I would like I would like to read out a definition of patronage so that I get it right. Um, it's a mutually symbiotic relationship between individuals in which the one with the higher socioeconomic position, which is usually the patron, exercises their influence and resources to provide for the other person of a lower status, which is the client, um, in exchange for support, assistance, uh, and services. Uh, so usually what happens here is that the patron is someone who's in the government, who could either be in the local government or could be like a police chief, for example, or someone with with power, uh, power to grant licenses uh, and, and power to grant protection. And the clients will usually be um, the companies uh, or the sort of company bosses in the companies. And they have very personal relationships and they support each other. The companies will get licenses, which maybe they would not be able to get in normal circumstances. And in return, um, they will be, you know, having them on the payroll and all this kind of stuff. And so that's a, there's a mutually supportive relationship there. So this happens very much, um, no, uh, happens uh, quite um, normally in not only every business, but almost every kind of uh, sector. Uh, but particularly for Hayes, why this is so important is because of, uh, this could be a good way for us to explain or to understand why peatlands are opening up in such a drastic manner. So I've, I've explained why peatlands are so important in terms of um, the environment. And governments generally do understand that. There's a lot of protective mechanisms around peatlands, especially in Indonesia. So there are laws that say that you should not open peatlands. Only very particular circumstances are you actually allowed to open peatlands uh, by law. Um, however, the situation is in Indonesia and Malaysia, about a quarter of all peatlands have been converted for industrial plantation purposes. And about three quarters of that quarter has been palm oil and the rest have mostly been um, pulp and paper. Uh, so the question is, how can this happen if there's laws uh, that is supposed to restrict the opening? So my analysis through my research um, I found that patronage is a very important explainer for that. So even though the, plant, the, the, the land is not supposed to be opened, the influence that the patrons and the clients have allow these licenses to be given out. And also um, 
taking it one step further, it protects the clients when there are fires on their lands. So even if it's intentional or unintentional, if there are fires, you can see that very rarely these clients do go to jail. They, they very rarely get brought to court. So there's not much accountability here. So I think this relationship can go a very far way in explaining, number one, how come these peatlands uh, have been opened up when they shouldn't have? And how come there hasn't been a stronger response to the fires that are on the peatland? So for those combined reasons, we can sort of explain um, or understand um, why this uh, persists and, and, and why it becomes so difficult for, for anyone to address it. When Jokowi, who, who is the current uh, president of Indonesia, came uh, into power, he did actually say that he's going to really cut down and, and go down hard on patronage. Um, and, you know, true enough, during his time, the, there was the most sort of number of court cases related to fires that actually came to court and went through the whole process. But that being said, that's a small success, but because patronage is just so um, running so deep because it's based on is based on personal relations. So it's really hard to break actually. Um, so that's a very big challenge, I think, that the, that the region faces to break that. Great, thank you so much. So that helps us understand how these um, large plantations become established on environmentally valuable peatlands. Um, your works also looked at other forms of gov environmental governance or transboundary accountability mechanisms that relate to Hayes, because as you mentioned at the beginning, Hayes is a local, but also a regional or a transboundary issue and has many environmental, economic and social consequences well beyond the location of the burning itself. Um, so I wonder if you could help explain a little bit on some of those key mechanisms. You, you mentioned earlier about ASEAN and ASEAN has, I think since 2012, the agreement on transboundary Hayes pollution. And also more recently, um, Singapore um, passed an act, the Singapore Transboundary Haze Pollution Act, which in itself is very um, interesting and innovative for us and e having extraterritorial obligations in a sense. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you could explain a bit more about how these work, how they came about, and maybe also importantly, do you think they've been effective or not to date? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so uh, uh, indeed, those are the two big things that are going on now in terms of the uh, sort of regional mechanisms to address haze. So ASEAN has actually recognized haze as a regional issue since 1985, at least. And if you imagine that has been like 40 years now, um, but, but ASEAN has still not been able to resolve it effectively. Um, so one of the sort of landmark, landmark um, frameworks is the ASEAN Haze Agreement, ASEAN Agreement for Transboundary Haze, which came into force in 2002, but um, only uh, had universal, um, uh, what do you call it, universal ratification in 2014. So there was about a 12 year lag in between that. But anyway, this, uh, this agreement was very significant because it was a legally binding agreement. And uh, ASEAN usually does not like legally binding agreements because ASEAN has its ASEAN way, which is um, you know, more of an um, informal way of doing things. But you know, the severity of the problem of the Hays uh, really pushed for the need for this legally binding agreement. So that is positive. However, the problem still remains in the details. If you look at the agreement itself, it is a legally binding agreement, but without teeth. There's no um, enforcement mechanisms. There's no place for punishment. There's no place for hard law. Uh, so the ideas are all there, but it cannot really be enforced strongly. Um, and also, uh, I, I would also mention that uh, Indonesia was the last to ratify 2014. So actually, everybody was waiting for Indonesia to ratify. And they were saying that, oh, as soon as Indonesia ratified, everything will be fine. But of course, we see even after 2014, we have had haze. Um, and, you know, because of the whole ASEAN way kind of thing, that, I mean, the, the whole ASEAN way atmosphere uh, that sort of colored all the ASEAN negotiations, um, it has also translated to quite weak um, operationalization of the ASEAN agreement. So there are things that until now has not been operationalized yet. So for example, the ASEAN Coordination Center for Hays, until now, uh, even though it has been agreed upon in the agreement has not still not been established. And this was very important because um, it would actually have a dedicated center for Hays. But at the moment, um, the, ASEAN, the ASEAN Secretariat, which is in jo uh, Jakarta, 
which never gets haze due to the, the nature of the weather, um, is handling the haze. Uh, so um, it's a lot of capacity problems. There's a lot of unwillingness for countries to share data uh, due to you know, sovereignty issues, non-interference. And it's also tied up in the problem that um, there are Malaysian interests in Indonesia who are also involved in some of the fires. There are Singaporean interests in Indonesia which have also been tied up in this. So there's all of these sensitivities involved. And as a result, the ASEAN agreement is there, but the, the sort of stage where it's at now is just trying to operationalize basic things that were agreed upon technically um, more than a decade ago, almost two decades ago, in fact. But, the, but, but it's still not fully operationalized. And this partly has led to the Transboundary Haze Pollution Agreement uh, by Singapore, uh, because Singapore actually at one point just kind of got fed up of waiting for the AATHP to get its act together. And Singapore said, OK, um, let's have our own extraterritorial law. And what this agreement is about is actually um, it, it, it uh, holds accountable anyone causing haze in Singapore. So no matter where you are, what nationality you are, if you are found to cause haze in Singapore, you could be liable under this act. Um, however, this um, caused a huge backlash in ASEAN. Indonesia said that um, Singapore was going too far. It overstepped its boundaries. It overstepped the ASEAN agreement. That's what, that's what uh, Indonesia also said. And it was Indonesia claimed that Singapore was being very un-ASEAN because it took a very hard law stance to try and do this. Um, so there was the problem between Indonesia and Singapore at the time. And because of that, uh, Singapore has not been able to also use its law because Indonesia does not, is not uh, willing to share the information. Indonesia is not willing to help with extradition. Uh, so the law exists, but at the same time, it has not been able to be um, to be operationalized as well. So that's the two, the status of the two mechanisms that you mentioned. Great, thanks so much. Um, earlier on, you mentioned that you had observed that companies were changing their behavior in part because of the discussion that's been taking place towards what's happening. Um, so I'm, I was wondering, um, you know, within ASEAN, there's also in many of the countries, like active researcher communities, active civil society movements, active community movements. Um, I wonder if you have observed any of like, the community or civil society or researcher groups have been able to influence the enforcement of these transboundary environmental governance mechanisms that are more operating state to state. Mm. Okay, that's a really good question because it has a lot of facets to it. So the Hays problem is actually, I think, very closely tied up to the international politics of palm oil. And Hays is a sort of a regional manifestation of the environmental issues that are leading from palm oil. So if you look at it on a larger scale, I would say a lot of the civil society movements that have tried to put um, the the environmental impacts of palm oil in the in the center has been more international. So things like uh, you know Greenpeace, WWF, the sort of in big international NGOs. So they don't only call attention to haze, but they call attention to things like deforestation, like flora and fauna, biodiversity, this kind of stuff. Uh, but the context of haze itself is a very regional thing because um, Europe will never get haze. Uh, so it's, it's a very regional thing. And I think the countries in Southeast Asia, uh, or other countries affected, they have been quite useful movements or quite active movements, very focused on haze. Uh, not so much on the other aspects, but just on haze, because this is what is affecting us, uh, the most immediate and the most sort of in-your-face uh, issue, right? So uh, for uh, Indonesia, of course, there are a lot of grassroots, grassroots movements, because um, Indonesia, you must remember, they are the worst uh, affected by haze always, uh, especially close to the fires. Uh, in Singapore, there has been uh, there have been organizations like PM Haze, and that has been very useful because PM Haze is actually trying to push for the recognition and the use of sustainable palm oil. And I think that is very important uh, when we want to, when, when we want to address the problem because I think because of how the international community has, has responded to the environmental effects of haze, there has been an overwhelming sense that 
palm oil is completely evil and completely bad and palm oil should just be banned and we should not even consider palm oil as any way useful. And that is very, I think, dangerous for the region because obviously palm oil is a very important economic part of the region. So uh, people like PM Hayes, they're actually pushing for the understanding that not all palm oil is unsustainable and we should be supportive of sustainable palm oil. And sustainable in the context of haze means no peatlands, no use of fire. So pushing for haze-free palm oil. And I think um, that is very important. And this should be something that goes beyond the region. Uh, because in the world, there's still so much misunderstanding about this. People do not know the difference between sustainable and unsustainable palm oil. Um, in Malaysia, there has been movements as well. Um, there's a group called Cerah. Cerah uh, translates to bright uh, in Malaysia, and they have been pushing for um, the break of this limitation of people discussing haze only during haze. So I think one of the limitations of haze is that it's seasonal. And therefore, people only remember or only are concerned or only worry about haze when they actually look at out the window and they see haze. And if you and if you don't, you just have a relief for a day and you kind of forget about it. So Chira is an organization that um, is trying to keep talking about haze throughout the year so people don't forget about it. Um, and I think that's also very useful as well to remember that haze, even though it's seasonal, even though it comes for a while and disappears, the impacts can go beyond. Like you see how many how many hundreds of thousands of people are affected and also can die from it. So these are some of the grassroots movement, I think, that are really focused on the regional aspect of the problem and are really focused on addressing particular aspects that not many people may realize about it um, and trying to get the understanding there and hopefully to have a more positive actual uh, impact on the ground. Right, so I think you've, you've really shown that this is a multifaceted policy problem, as well as the translation of policy into practice, which in itself is a challenge. Um, in one of your recent papers, you were also talking about a kind of a trade-off debate between economic growth and public health in Malaysia, um, which, you know, as you've already mentioned, must also be multifaceted because you've mentioned that some Malaysian companies, for example, invest in places that generate haze, but then there's also this impact onto Malaysia as well from haze. So I was wondering if you, like, this would be a kind of give us a lens into understanding how the debate is playing out, like whose voices are heard, whose interests are considered. So could you outline a bit how that debate has unfolded of economic growth versus public health in Malaysia? Mm. And why, what has been the outcome of that and why? Sure. Uh, in Malaysia, especially, um, I think you could probably say there's about two phases about how haze has been connected to the economy in Malaysia. So um, the early days of haze, uh, the, the first time we had a really big event was 1997. Um, and at that time, if you look at the newspapers and if you look at you know, the ministers talking about haze at that time, you will see that it was very much uh, tied to tourism. So the idea was that, you know, people around the world would not want to come to Malaysia or even to Indonesia uh, because they would not, the, it was unsafe, number one, and it was not beautiful. Uh, you would not be able to come and see the nice skyline. You would not be able to come and enjoy the beach. Um, so it was, it was tied to this fear that Malaysia would lose out in tourism revenue. And indeed, tourism is very important in Malaysia. So um, there was a lot of conversation at that time about you know, ministers saying, don't talk about haze. It's not, don't, don't, don't complain about it. It's not as bad as, it, as, as you think it is uh, because they didn't want to discourage people from coming in. And it actually went as far as the Malaysian uh, government, um, uh, how to say, uh, you know, CNN uh, was actually confronted by the Malaysian government and CNN had to apologize actually. Uh, and, and they had to give some exchange, uh, some airtime uh, because, uh, the Malaysian government said that they had unfairly represented Malaysia during the haze season. And so the airtime was supposed to promote Malaysia as a, as a tourism destination. 
so that was sort of the conversation at that time, um, saying that, you know, it's not that bad. Um, things are being blown out of proportion by the media. And then there will also be um, ministers saying that, oh, as long as you don't breathe too hard, it's okay. It's not going to be too dangerous for you. So this was very, of course, very early times. People didn't really know. There was not much research going on about the toxicity of haze. So probably understandable, but at the same time, um, looking back, it was really endangering the people even more by, by not being that seriously responsive about the health effects uh, of haze. And then a uh, few years later, this was the time of the palm oil boom, the late 1990s, early 2000s, palm oil became a very big thing. And then um, there was that link that was made between palm oil and fires and haze. And at this point, um, again, tied up to the sort of international palm oil debate or international palm oil politics. Um, the way that Malaysia responded to this was that uh, it was, you know, it was unfair that people are blaming uh, the region uh, for being bad to the environment. Uh, and this was sort of like a vendetta against uh, Southeast Asia. And most of this was not true blown out of proportion again. Um, there were lies. They were purposely trying to keep us from developing. Um, and this was all tied up very closely with haze. And if you see during the haze, there will always be in the media um, stories about so-and-so plantation was found to have fires. Uh, but, and then this could be Malaysian plantations even in Indonesia. And the response from the government has always been that, oh, we have checked and there's no fires, case closed. So very little accountability. Um, and of course, is it possible for them to properly check after one day? It's a bit, uh, it's a bit uh, unbelievable. So it's always a sort of downplaying of number one, Malaysia's role in the problem, even though Indonesian government will report that number one, number two, number three companies are Malaysian companies. Uh, Malaysia will always refuse to acknowledge that their companies were involved. And number two, um, sort of this downplaying of the severity and, uh, and again, sort of saying that, okay, it's going to be over very soon. The rains will come. Uh, it's going to be over as soon as the rain comes. It's just a temporary thing. Things will be okay eventually. So um, it was always this um, tied up in sort of like, um, we shouldn't make a big deal about it. Uh, and actually, um, there was actually, and I think this has kind of trickled down to the, to the social level as well. Uh, there was a research uh, done by Nottingham Malaysia where they sort of asked people about their opinions uh, about this um, environmental, developmental um, sort of uh, relationship, right, in Malaysia. And actually the results showed quite interestingly, a big proportion of Malaysians thought that some uh, environmental deterioration, some environmental pollution was acceptable in exchange for development. So this has sort of become part of the Malaysian psyche to a certain extent. It was not the majority, but I believe it was like, I think about 35 or 40% survey said that, you know, they could deal with some and it was an acceptable price to pay. So um, this shows that, uh, at least for Malaysia, this whole process of, 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 of um, you know, trade-off, uh, it has become very much ingrained and almost like, uh, we cannot, ex how else are we going to develop something like that? Uh, so I think the challenge now is to really figure out how to approach development um, in a sustainable way, which is why this whole sustainable palm oil conversation uh, is so important right now. I think that leads um, well to uh, one of the last questions, which is, I mean, You've shown that this is a really important issue for the region and it has environmental, social and health consequences, but it's also an economic activity that's important uh, to a number of companies and to the, to the wider region's governments. Um, but then it also, so how, how to deal with the transboundary haze problem? Like you've outlined a couple of the state to state initiatives and some of the civil society actions. Which ones do you think offer to be or seem to be the most promising and why? Mm. Um, I think it is, uh, well, like I mentioned, the sustainable versus non-sustainable thing is very important. Um, so I think the challenge now is for the industry to, number one, own up to the problems internally. Uh, and number two, uh, to sort of build up its 
uh, reputation again because it has taken a hit. And how to do that actually is to really bank on this sustainable certification uh, and get people confident in, in, in the accuracy or in the legitimacy of this sustainable certification. Because at the moment, I think because of the whole sort of anti-palm oil drama, even with the certification, people are still questioning. So it has to be both ways. Uh, you must also show that you are able to be trusted, for people to, be, to trust you. So it has to go both ways. But at the same time, I think there's also a need for the world out there, the market out there, to be more supportive of uh, palm oil as well. Uh, at the moment, uh, even though there are sustainable palm oil being produced, a lot of them are not being able to be sold and at the price, the premium price of sustainable palm oil. So let's say an RSPO certified palm oil, um, the, the buyers may not want to buy it at a premium price because it does take more to produce palm oil sustainably. So you have to be able, you have to be willing to pay for it as well. So the big market out there, they want sustainable palm oil, but they're not willing to pay the price for it. So I think there also has to be a sort of a give and take there. So when there is more willingness from the market to buy sustainable palm oil, I think that will also be the impetus for the local uh, for the local companies to really dedicate themselves into making sure that their sustainable palm oil is properly sustainable and traceable and all that. So I think it has to work. Uh, both ways in that sense. So I think the the whole palm oil debate has created very, a lot of animosity on both sides. So it becomes very difficult for um, for both sides to sort of give in. But but both sides need to show their commitment in a way uh, in order for this to move forward. Um, so as I mentioned, for haze, it's very simple: no planting on peat um, and no fires. So under RSPO. It's already there. You're not supposed to have any new plantations on peat. Any old plantations on peat have to be managed very carefully. And one of the interesting things with RSPO is that um, every time you want to replant, because palm oil every 20 years you should you, you need to replant, um, you have to actually have a drainability assessment if you're on peat. So you must see, is it worth replanting or is it not going to be worth it? Because um, if, if the, uh, when you plant on peat, the other challenge is that it sinks, the land becomes lower and lower and lower. And especially if you are beside the sea, after a while, the land will become so low and the seawater will come in. And that means that you're not going to be able to use the land anyway. So this is also another way for RSPO to discourage uh, prolonged use of peatlands. And if that's the case, if you do your renewability assessment and it's, if it's not going to last you beyond 40 years, the recommendation is to re re rehabilitate the area instead of replanting. So these are some of the things that are already in place. Um, and I think that should be the real push there to try and maybe get out the word that this is happening in the industry and there should be support. And at the same time, the industry also should be less uh, defensive, you know, and more open to frank discussions uh, with the markets. And it should be something that we can mutually see eye to eye. Thank you so much. That This leads, I think, to the final question. Um, it seems to me that knowing what's happening is really important and then an analysis of why things are happening the way that they are and is a precursor to really thinking how can things change. Um, so you, your research is at the forefront of really understanding the relationship between the agribusiness, the governance of the sector and haze and its impacts. I wonder if you could help lay out what you would see as a priority research agenda um, for those that are interested in this topic? So I think um, very importantly now is uh, research into how ASEAN's mechanisms can be improved. Um, ASEAN has plans, for example, ASEAN has a roadmap, ASEAN Haze Free Roadmap. And the roadmap was supposed to be for ASEAN to be haze free by 2020. Uh, and of course, we've had 2020 come and go, and there was no haze, uh, partially because uh, of COVID. Uh, but of course, you know, um, the, the challenge here is for us to figure out as academics or as practitioners even, how can the ASEAN mechanism with all of its limitations with ASEAN way and with the fact that all our countries are still developing or most of our countries are still developing, how, to, how do we uh, create novel um, mechanisms that would be acceptable within the ASEAN context, whether it be under the ASEAN region or under something else? Um, so I think 
uh, the regional cooperation aspect is still something that is, it has been researched a lot, but um, there's, there's some, I mean, we haven't really been able to have anything really novel that has been able to resolve. A lot of the research has been why the mechanisms have not worked, but not really so much about what else can we do. So that's one thing, I think. The other thing uh, that's very important now is for on the ground research on medium and small size plantations. Uh, because uh, much of the research in the past has focused on the large plantations and we see that it has worked. Large plantations are being more responsive. They are being more careful because it, um, pressure, public pressure, public uh, opinion, uh, when we get this research out there, it works. They become more aware that people are aware of what's happening and therefore uh, they have uh, progressed. Of course, they're not perfect yet, but definitely there's been improvements. But medium-sized companies, small companies, they are not famous. People don't know their names. So um, not much is known about them. So they are still in this gray area. So I think the research has really to come down to this level to see whether are they, um, are they a, number one, are they a big factor in the problem? We don't really know yet. Uh, and number two, how can we engage these companies also in the certification uh, programs? How can we help these companies to be more able to, to be sustainable? And I think um, finally, a long running problem or a long running issue um, in palm oil in the sector itself is uh, intensification. And what that means is to reduce impact on land use change meaning how do we maintain the productivity in the sector uh, without having to add land? Um, and that's very important. There's so much potential actually with palm oil. Palm oil can continue to bear fruit for tens of years, even beyond the 20 year cycle that usually people, uh, people follow. Um, and palm oil uh, can yield actually so much more. The average yield is quite low compared to what palm oil actually can, uh, can produce. So there are many ways for us to um, research into maintaining what we have now in terms of land, but making sure we can get more out of it. So in order to reduce the pressure to open up more land. Um, so I think with all that combined, I think that we can you know, probably manage the response to haze better through ASEAN. Uh, manage the root causes through the medium and small companies and also manage the industry itself to make sure that the industry can still prosper and bring and bring um, development to the region without bringing more uh, damage to our environment. Great, thank you so much. I think that's probably all we have time to discuss today. But for those that have listened to this dialogue, Helena writes many papers as well as uh, in the media and so on. So there's much more to read uh, if you're interested to learn more about Helena's work. Um, and I think with that, I'd just like to say on behalf of CSDS, thank you very much for joining us today. That was a really interesting and insightful discussion. And thank I hope so that we'll much. be able to invite you back a few years from now where we can sure. conclude that haze has become less of a difficulty than it is now. Hopefully, yes, definitely. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much.